All right, hi everybody, welcome back. John Meadows here, and I'm with my good friend, Dr. Mario Novo, who you know has co-wrote our manuals. We've worked on them together, the chest training manual, the back training manual, the arm training manual, and he's put up a lot of articles on the training side. Now, Mario is uh, one of the four, foremost experts in occlusion training, blood flow restriction. And you know, we started putting this in programs, I think maybe about five years ago, but honestly, we weren't real precise. It was, hey, take a, um, a knee wrap, wrap it around your upper quad or wrap it around your upper arm and you wanted to be about 70% tight. Well, that's obviously very arbitrary, but the work that Mario has been doing now is very precise. So you guys are gonna to get to see something really cool today that Mario's presenting at this symposium. So uh, I want you guys to just check this out. Mario's gonna walk you through the process now and um, talk to you about a little bit of the benefits, but so, all right, let's go, my man. Let's take it away. So in regards to precision, when we're talking about BFR, where we currently are now and basically like the 21st century of what BFR should be, how to make it effective, is we wanna make it relative across the board. So the research tells us that 50% of something called your limb occlusion pressure, and that's the minimal amount of pressure needed to actually cut off the arterial flow to the arm, we're gonna train at a percentage of that. So he still has arterial flow coming in, but it's so slow that it's gonna increase the amount of fatigue that much faster. So the amount of time he actually needs to train is gonna be cut down, but equally the amount of weight that, he's necess that he actually needs to lift is going to also be cut down. But it doesn't mean we're not gonna have the same hypertrophic effects. In fact, we'll likely have even more hypertrophic effects because we can train a little bit more regularly with it but there's also some other benefits that you and I have discussed kind of on the side in regards to increasing capillary filtration rate, actually building more capillary networks into the muscle, also helping to feed more nutrition to the bone, and as well as some other effects that may have on some of the anabolic hormones. So what you're gonna see me do now, John's already got a tourniquet on his right arm. These are single chamber uh, tourniquets. So these are actually manufactured, this is a US-based company out of Ohio, so in your state. Uh, it's a medical registered company called Smart Tools. Uh, these are the generation two that I helped them to design. It's a single bladder system. So it's going to do exactly what the research tourniquets can do. You can see they open up. They've got an additional strap that you're gonna see me put on so it doesn't try to slide off John's arm once it's on. And let's get to it. So we're gonna do our best to do this sitting down. <laughs> Typically I'd have a patient on a bed or something, right? Control it, control it that way. So once the tourniquet is on, I've got my little safety straps on so it doesn't try to slide. As you know, our, our muscles are not cylinders, they're cones. We wanna have something that's gonna hold still. I'm gonna go ahead now and hook them up. So these are one-way valves, so pressure goes in, can't come back out, so uh, the cuffs themselves cannot leak. Once the pressure's in, pressure's locked in the entire time until you're gonna release it. I'm gonna get a small amount of pressure already in there to create what we call a barrel reflex. So you can see the pressure's there at 50. I'm palpating, I can feel here I've got his pulse on his distal radial artery. Now, I'm gonna put a little bit of some, of a medium so that I can actually zone in and listen to the arterial pulse. There it is. Make sure that's nice and loud. So we're gonna start increasing pressure by 50 millimeters of mercury at a time until we no longer have any pulse. I'm gonna give it a couple seconds there. All right, so we've lost John's pulse, somewhere getting to about 215 millimeters of mercury. We're gonna drop down until that pulse comes back. So about 185, it starts coming back on this arm. We're gonna do that so we can basically take the average of three. We'll see it happen again and hear it. It's getting a little loud in our space right now. Sorry guys, I had some people walking by. <laughs> yep, so 185 is gonna be his left arm's limb occlusion pressure. 
His right arm was at 190 millimeters of mercury. So what defines the characteristics that can change limb occlusion pressure? Limb circumference, right? When we have a larger limb, we need more pressure. So if I just chose an arbitrary amount of pressure for John, and I, and I, and I use that same pressure for me, he may be under or he may be over. So if he's under, you probably got a lot of reps that you can do. And if you're over, you might not be able to get any work right. done, right? And this arm is a little, it's a little bit bigger. So that would follow with Correct. what you're saying. Right. Yeah. Yep, so we're gonna do a quick little math here, 185. So 50%, he's gonna be close to it. It's gonna be about 92. We're gonna lower the pressure so he's at 50 uh, percent of his LOP. Give me a little bicep curl. We're just gonna calibrate that cuff. Cool, come back. Yeah, and I just rest the arm on the bottom. Nice. Okay, let's fill up the other arm. We already had this pressure. We took this all off camera. So measuring LOP is actually only done one time a week or one time every week and a half. So you don't have to do this consistently all the time. Go ahead and give me a little bicep curl. Cool, relax. Go again. Relax. All right, so got a band here. Let's set up some bicep curls, man. Okay, all right. So with BFR, generally speaking, we're gonna be at a four set rep range if we're doing this with exercise. The first set is gonna be 30 repetitions. So oh, it's, kind of yeah, so it's a 202 tempo. So you're just thinking one, two, one, two. The idea why we're doing 30 repetitions is to pre-fatigue the muscle. Remember, what defines hypertrophy in 2018 is fatigue. We understand that with fatigue, we increase in metabolites, right? And there's a vice versa relationship with them as metabolites increase, so does fatigue. And with it, increases the amount of force production per muscle fiber, which leads to hypertrophy changes happening. So BFR is simply just making an artificial environment that looks like high intensity, but we have to kind of potentiate it. So the first and set- And I can pump my arms up before I do my presentation. You can, yeah. Actually, yeah, because you're about to go on stage. <laughs> we actually do have some bodybuilders, some, I, uh, some IFBB pros that are actually doing this prior to going up there. <laughs> prior to going on the stage, get nice and veiny. So how are you feeling already with that? It's burning like fire. 28, yeah. 29, Nine. 30. All right, so he's gonna take a 30 second break now. Now, it's not really like taking a rest. If we looked at the level of oxygenization in his arm, it's not going back up to baseline because he cannot get more oxygen in. We've restricted it, but now we've also increased the amount of literal byproduct, things like lactic acid. You guys are pretty familiar with that. Hydrogen and inorganic phosphates, all these metabolites are starving that muscle of continual oxygen. Hit it, ready to go, 15 reps now. So as he's now going through these reps, which you start to see. painful. Yeah, and now, now this is BFR though. And you I know. have a very high pain tolerance. I know. So when you're doing it correctly is you're not going to be having a big smile on your face doing BFR. It's going to be quite difficult to do. And mind you, this is what we consider the last pillar of BFR. Nice. Got another 30 seconds. With a pillar before this being walking, riding a bike, or the pillar even lower than that is, ex is no exercise at all doing BFR. And that's actually how it's already being used in the ICU. It's how it's being used preoperatively and postoperatively in cases where individuals are really compromised as a means of maintaining muscle mass and maintaining strength because there is evidence to suggest that's exactly what's happening when we slightly cr uh, create a little hypoxic or low oxygen environment. All right, hit it up around 15. You got one more set after this. So this should already feel pretty different to the, like just wrapping with a knee wrap. Yeah, it's, it's there. <laughs> yeah. I feel it. Yep. So one of the other benefits, you want to talk about some of the other stuff with it or? Um, well, we'll you keep know, this one basic. what happens is I get questions on this and people go, one of the common questions I get from people is, are you going to do damage to like arteries and veins? That's right. the number one question I get. Is it safe or is it dangerous? Yeah. So a good way to respond with that is tourniquets in and of themselves do not pose a risk of increasing a clot. In fact, tourniquets decrease the risk of a clot because when you deflate it, your arteries release something called TPA. TPA is an enzyme that actually breaks apart clots and it's what you'd be given in the hospital if you were having a stroke. So the same thing happens, natural production. right? Same thing happens with high intensity training. Go your last set. High intensity training is actually quite effective at decreasing clot formation and improving capillary compliance because it does the same thing. When your muscles contract and they're heavy weight, they push blood away from them and they become hypoxic in that scenario. But during rest, you obviously reoxygenate and then things go back down to baseline. With BFR, there's no way around it. Nice. So we're going to deflate. 
The other question I get is, can this help develop vasculature? Um, and the answer to that is, it um, definitely can. <laughs> yes, it can. Yeah. So when you place a muscle uh, and, a, and a bone more specifically into a hypoxic environment, you have this really cool thing called vascular endothelial growth factor. Basically, it is growth factor to make more capillaries. And more capillaries require then more veins because you're obviously feeding the bone and muscle more nutrition, but you also have to make avenues to get this stuff out, right? right? right. And part right. of that adaptive process for bodybuilding that makes them veiny, right, is a high volume work where they are working into a hypoxic environment. Yeah. You know, that's, that's, yeah. that's a very common goal for bodybuilders to be at that 60% of a 1RM and training to not always failure, but training to fatigue, yeah. right? Saving some stuff in the bank when the goal is, you know, for some strength, but yep. yeah. Uh, right. may, maybe one other thing we can talk about for damage. So since he's training with super light, low loads, there's a whole lot less muscle damage. So if you consider with, high, with heavy weight training, you usually take what, like two days to maybe get back to same muscle group or depends? Yeah, it depends, but this is like an awesome topic, muscle damage itself, because the thought has always been we need a lot of it. And I think back and the people who follow me will tell you that in 2012, I had one of my best years. I gained a lot of muscle, and that's when I didn't get sore. Like I felt, if you correlate damage to soreness, mm -hmm. I was I the remember least that sore now, yeah. I'd ever been. And yeah. I grew and I grew and I grew, and I started thinking, man, maybe I wasn't, maybe I don't need the kind of damage that I thought because I used to equate workout success with damage. Like the more sore I get, the better the workout must have been. And I mm -hmm. think that was a little misguided. I don't think the amount of damage was really necessary. Yeah. So I think this is another tool to create that growth without the overwhelming amount of damage yeah. where well, you can't train again. Yeah, and what we're learning about damage is like historically, damage was necessary to get what we call these satellite cells. It's like your, your muscle stem cell that'll actually help mm -hmm. it to heal fast. Now, people who are genetically gifted have more muscle cells, like actual nuclei along their muscle. And how they get that is from satellite cells donating that. Now, when you're good genetically you know, gifted, your satellite cells will relatively give that, but you gotta still work hard because at a certain point, the, the return on results diminishes, right? You have to find other strategies. So historically, heavyweight training has been used for that. What we're finding with BFR is that we're seeing an order of magnitude, almost like a 60% increase in satellite cell proliferation and fusion with BFR going well past day 10. You don't see that with high intensity weight training. Typically, you only see it maybe occur within the first 48 or maybe even a, maybe a few days after that, 72 hours maybe peaking and then just dropping off from there. So with BFR, there is good evidence to support that the reason why we see people make gains and then make gains even after training that stick with them is because they're actually making new myocytes due to a lot of satellite cells thinking something must have happened because that wasn't easy. Like yeah, that that's sucked. Hard. Yeah. That's so, his muscle doesn't know any difference that that was super lightweight. All it knows is my bell got rang, pardon me, pardon my yeah. French. My bell got rang. I'm going to make some adaptive changes from that. I'm going to try to uh, make more uh, nuclei to make more protein. So protein synthesis goes up as a result of it. But at the same go, his anterior pituitary thinks there must have been damage down here. And you're going to see a growth hormone effect similar to high intensity weight training. And in some cases, if we do it for the legs, likely even higher than high intensity weight training yeah, and that's you know that's your medicine i think it makes know? a good uh combination right so i i use bfr mainly with people who are injured so they can still stimulate right like i do fibers. yeah but i feel like it's a good combination because listen guys like me i'm never going to stop training some of the heavy stuff like mm -hmm. it's fun it's enjoyable but you see, you have to have other tools in your toolbox. Yeah, outside, think about your joints, you know. Outside of that, yeah, especially you know, I'm in 30 something years now, so my joint health is, so things like this are really cool. And then I think even for a young guy, it's still um, being uh, proactive. Yeah, for sure. And hey, you can still get your heavy stuff in, but now let's work some of this stuff in intelligently to mm -hmm. extend your lifespan in, in the training aspect. Of and life. enjoyment, you and know. Enjoyment, man. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, we know weight training is, is likely a plays a big role with increasing longevity of your life you know you lift weights you keep your muscle healthy it's an organ right it helps to maintain lower levels of blood glucose helps to regulate blood pressure regulate heart rate uh, regulate hormones that are necessary for vital organ function including your brain so when we're thinking about things like dementia uh, um, uh, alzheimer's disease right these things are our muscle is a way that we tap into our brain 
to also augment things like pain and yeah. perceived exertion that help us to manage just day-to-day -day stress in life. So yeah. making muscle on a, in an easier way, right, is a goal that we should really be focused on. You know, there's a lot of people that are going to be getting older and living longer. Uh, so can we get them there also, but having them healthier, right? Uh, so that they don't have to utilize as much healthcare and, and, and vice versa. But yeah, for, for a guy who's actually training, um, we're already working to implement it into their actual programming. So they're using it like on deload weeks. Uh, they're sprinkling it in with actual throughout their, their, their training sessions. So, so you did heavy legs. You trained arms maybe a day ago. Well, let's maybe do some light load stuff also for the arms now, yeah. but more of a capacity to actually help the arms maybe heal and recover faster. Right. And there's good evidence behind all this stuff. So. None of the stuff you know that I do is anecdotal. If any of you have, have downloaded these manuals you know, that we've done, there's a, a ton of evidence. There's a paper for everything that we put out there, which I think is important, right? We're just helping to drive that narrative. That's right. So. All right, guys. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this. So for my man Mario here, we'll see you next time.